Hello and welcome. This is Ip, the Christian filmmaker. In the last lectures, we already established that the plot of an image is ideally revealed by visual means. The simplest way to do so is to use thingies, like this revolver in the gangster's hand. Let us now consider what we can do with dialogue. Instead of stating the obvious, like him going, this is a stick-up, we can use the spoken words to give a characterization of the person speaking. Where is he from? What is his social class? Is he witty, fancy, dull? Accent, choice of words, amongst other features, will give it away. Now let's delve deeper into the realm of semantics in movie dialogue. Before we introduced the rule of thumb, stating that in movies you should tell the story by visual means, like the use of thingies, and treat dialogue more like some sort of characterizing noise. A good screenplay consists of good thingies rather than witty dialogue. So let me show you how dialogue can create tension in a scene by what I call the semantic gap. Let's pause and watch a clip from the hit series The Sopranos, in which tensions rise between mobster Paulie Walnut and the uh, consigliere Silvio Dante. As Paulie cannot stop talking about cleanliness in public bathrooms. Pause and click on the link in the description, watch and come back to resume this video. You see, there is considerable tension in that scene created by that semantic gap. On the one hand, there is the visual stuff, spaghetti soaked in gravy, and the spoken stuff on the other, shoelaces soaked in urine. Thus, Pauli Walnut manages to create an ambience that has a dramatic effect. Paulie's little monologue somewhat imposes a public bathroom onto and around the dining table. The semantic gap creates tension by putting things where they do not belong. Remember what we said about the old notebook in one of our earlier lessons? Let's assume we are going to write a scene in which our hero finds a mysterious and important notebook. Where should this scene take place? In a library? Well, rather not. That's boring. An old attic? Yeah, maybe, but still, there are better ways. Why not amidst the flames of a great fire? Imagine our hero staring at a fireplace when he beholds a book about to be consumed by the flames. The pages curl up in the heat, and all of a sudden our hero eyes something that makes him rush to the flames, rescue the book, and extinguish the fire. Now we know this is an important book, and we are interested. So that's what we have to do when considering the foil effect. Put things in a setting where they grab our attention. It's almost the same effect in reverse by the use of words. There are places where you may wish to eat and there are places where you might relieve yourself. Places are always connected to a set of priorities about what you may wish for. You can order a sandwich at a delicatessen and you can ask for blessings at a church, but not the other way round. As a filmmaker, you try to understand the rules that govern places, and then you misplace as many things as possible so that the problem underlying the story will be augmented in the most effective way. For the moment spoken language is used in a film, we perceive two different channels of information. What we see 
and what we hear. And what we hear is what is being asserted by the screen characters. This can be a source of conflict. Naturally, we trust our eyes more than our ears. After all, what we see is what we witness. The spoken word, yet, we regard as a testimony. Such testimony can be false. And that's the point where we open our next chapter. How movie characters use words to get what they want. We'll talk about that in our next lecture about strategies and tactics of fictional characters and how to apply them when writing smart dialogue. Bear with us, have a good week and God bless.